Hello, my name is Aislinn and I'll be talking to you today about the Dina Shi. Now the Dina Shi come out of ancient Irish mythology. They're often talked about in Wiccan and Pagan circles, but they're rarely understood. This is because those responsible for passing on the myths and legends of Ireland had to do so orally. Over time, this results in things being changed or even completely forgotten. This is normal, it happens, it's a shame, but we do still have some information about what the Dina Shi were, and it's helpful to share that today. Now, the Dina Shi come out of the Tuatha Dé Danann. The Tuatha Dé Danann existed first, and we're not going to specifically talk about the Dé Danann today, but it is important to note that the Tuatha Dé Danann diminished and then split. How many categories they split into is still up for much debate. For the purposes of this video, we're going to just say they split into two groups. We're going to say the Dina Shi over here and the Fenian heroes over here. I'm also not specifically talking about the Fenian heroes, though I can't help but mention them as we go through this video. Alright, so the Dina Shi, as an incarnation of fairy, consisted of those Tuatha Dé Danann who chose to continue as the fairy folk of Ireland, at least for a little while. The Dina Shi are considered to be the fairy folk of ancient Ireland. Really the first time this term was used in a manner we might recognize today. They were what the Tuatha Dé Danann became as they diminished. Some early myths from the church indicate that they were fallen angels, considered to be too good for hell, but this was simply a way for the church to invalidate the mythology of Ireland. It had little to do with the true legends regarding the Dina Shi. Now again we come back to the Fenian heroes because I really can't get away from them. They're too closely linked to the Dina Shi. So the Fenian heroes were those of the Dodonan who chose to follow the High Kings of Ireland. They joined with the Fianna and fought alongside their human allies. The Dina Shi did almost the exact opposite. After the Tuatha Dé Danann and the Milicians battled and divided up Ireland into the land and the spirit world, those who became the Dina Shi retreated beneath the earth to live in the hollow mounds. Others chose to make their home in the oceans or under the waves or in the forests, anywhere that wasn't completely inhabited by people. The Fenian heroes had great respect for the Dina Shi, despite their different choices. The mounds where the Shi made their homes became places of worship for the Fenian heroes and those humans they coexisted with. The waves which are said to be inhabited by the Shi were also held as sacred, so there was still a deep link between the two groups, even if they didn't coexist on an everyday basis. So, the Dina Shi were the original fairy folk, and like any group, they divided themselves into subgroups. It's easiest to explain these groups using broad categories. Usually, people like to think of things in terms of good and evil. So in this case, it's actually quite easy to talk about the Dina Shi not as good and evil, but as good and maybe not quite so good. <laughs> In some versions of Irish mythology, the Dina Shi eventually divided themselves into the Sili and the Unsili courts. The Sili court was considered to be blessed or holy, containing those of the Shi who were benevolent and generally considered harmless. This was not to say that they would not seek vengeance. Vengeance was just a part of life, especially in ancient Ireland. But if given the choice between harming and helping, the Sili would choose to help provided there wasn't any wrong that they had to avenge at that given moment. The members of the Sili court were said to be fun-loving and mischievous. They loved their games and pranks, but they didn't generally take a joke too far. They were known to be kind and generous, and seen as the champions of the people of Ireland. Now, accidents did happen. You know, the occasional will-o'-wisp leading a traveler astray and the traveler accidentally drowns. Okay, it happened. It wasn't done maliciously, but any prank can be taken too far. Still, it's important to remember the intent when we're distinguishing between the Sili and the Unsili courts. The Unsili were almost the polar opposite of the Sili. They were malicious and tended to be inclined towards evil. They were said to assault travelers at night, maybe carrying them off into their own world for whatever purpose. As the Sili were not entirely kind, 
purposely were not entirely evil, but, you know, if faced with the choice, they would really rather cause harm than offer assistance, at least most of the time. So the Dinashi, consisting of both the Sili and the Unsili courts, were really the last of the Tuatha de Danann to resemble the gods and goddesses of ancient Ireland. But they were also the very first real incarnation of the fairy, so it's the Dinashi that bridged this gap. Though they generally chose to take human form, they could also appear as much larger or much smaller than the average person. Their shape-shifting abilities were renowned, their use of magic was almost as powerful as that of the Tuatha de Danann even though they were diminished in both power and ability. Now, time changes everything, even the Dina Shi. Eventually, they did begin to diminish, moving further away from their origins and eventually dwindling into what is now known as the heroic fairy. This does not diminish their contributions to the fairy lineage or their importance to ancient Ireland. Now, if you want more information about the Dina Shi, your best bet is to look at the ancient Irish myths. Most books today don't do them justice, so taking a look at the actual stories from that era is a really good idea. Personally, I like this book. Lost its dust cover I've had in a long time. It belonged to my grandfather. It's called Myths and Folklores of Ireland. It's by Jeremiah Curtin. You can see my pages are quite yellowed. <laughs> It's been in the family a while. This one was published in 1975, a few years before I was born. I think you can still get it. If you can't, go to your local library. They'll either have a copy or know who does. Now, if your interests are more modern and you'd like to know more about modern fairies, I recommend A Witch's Guide to Fairy Folk. It's by McCoy. This one is easy to find. It is still in print. It's all over the place. I've even seen it in most local libraries, so it shouldn't be that hard to find. Probably a friend of yours, someone you know, someone your friends know, will have a copy. This is really good for understanding the different kinds of fairies, especially after they began to diminish and became real fairies. <laughs> Other books you might want to check out are uh, Celtic Myths and Legends. That's by a man named Ellis. Another book by him is A Dictionary of Irish Mythology. Those are both very good references for ancient Irish myths. Also, Early Irish Myths and Sagas by Geoffrey Gantz, G-A-N-T-Z. That one, I've had that for years. It's probably about 30 years old now. I think you can still find it. Um, Over Nine Waves is a book of Irish legends. It's by Marie Heaney, H-E-A-N-E-Y. I really enjoy her work. That one's not quite as old, a little more recent, 95. So it has some updated information that you won't necessarily find in the other books. But if you want to go back again to the 80s, Lady Gregory wrote Treasury of Irish Myths, Legends, and Folklore. This one is all about the fairy and folk tales of the Irish, Irish peasantry. That one is another one of my favorites, though personally I would go with Jeremiah Curtin. Okay. If you can find the dust cover, <laughs> good for you. Most of them don't seem to have their dust covers. Uh, that's all for today. I will talk to you again soon, hopefully within the next few days. Thanks a lot. Bye now.